Hello, my name is Dr. Ben Thompson. This is the Treble Health Podcast, and I am here with a special guest, Dr. Robert Suido. Dr. Suido has a long career in the audiology profession, and he has graciously offered to share his insights over decades of clinical experience and expertise in tinnitus and clinical research for tinnitus. We're going to talk about sound therapy for tinnitus, different cognitive behavioral approaches, and a history of tinnitus treatment devices over the decades. This surely will be a great episode. Dr. Suido received his initial degree from the University of Iowa, which is an amazing audiology institution, as well as a master's degree in communications disorder from University of Southern California, as well as a PhD in audiology from Northwestern University. Dr. Suido is former director of audiology and clinical professor of otolaryngology, ear, nose, and throat, at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF Medical Center, where I was an audiology resident and had a great time as well after Dr. Suido's tenure there. And Dr. Suido himself is world recognized for contributions that he has made specifically for tinnitus. So happy to have you on, Dr. Suido. Tell us a bit about where is your attention? Where is your focus for the tinnitus patient? What is your message of hope? What is your message of insight and information for our community here? Well, I think that probably my message of hope is that there are many, many approaches to tinnitus, many approaches. And I think that if you look at the literature, they will say the 80% of patients who undergo some kind of treatment will improve. That's not the same as will be cured, but will improve. And I think that that's probably a fairly valid statement. I think that it's essential to understand that there is no one approach that's right for every patient. There's no one fit, one size fits all for tinnitus patients. And largely because there are so many causes and so many emotional aspects of tinnitus. So I think that the best approach to dealing with a tinnitus patient is to recognize that the audiologist or the therapist or whoever's providing the tinnitus treatment has to be flexible and the patient has to be flexible and the patient has to understand that if they improve, it's because they have done the work. It's not all about, I know all of us as professionals love to hear the patient say, oh, thank you, doctor. You were so helpful to me. You've changed my life. It's wonderful to hear something like that. But the reality is, is when a tinnitus patient improves, it's because they've put in the work. They've put in the adjustments in their life that they need to put in. And I think that um, the best therapist for them is somebody who will recognize that if one approach doesn't work, Let's shift to the next approach and let's not stay with just one thing, which may be a a complete waste of time and which will say to the patient, I don't really know where we should be going on this. So I think that 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 patients should always understand that they can improve, but it's going to be really some work on their part with some guidance from the professional. And improvements, success, that's why we do what we do. We're going towards that place. Having a roadmap, having a guideline is something that my team of audiologists tries always to you know, communicate. How do you define success, Dr. Suido, in your years of working clinically and with research? How does one define success with tinnitus other than simply maybe a questionnaire or something that is written? How, does, how do you define success? You know, it's a, it's a great question. And I mean, I've been involved with the development of a lot of the standard written questionnaires and ways to score things and to weigh different aspects of how a person's dealing with tinnitus. Ultimately, the scores are very nice. You could figure out statistically what is an actual improvement based on a standardized scoring procedure. But ultimately, it's all about the quality of life for the patient. I mean, if I have a patient who has made very minimal improvement on a test score, but who tells me, you know what, 
now I can sleep. Now I can read. Now I'm starting to learn how to enjoy my life. I'm not afraid to go out. I'm not afraid to go to social engagements. I'm enjoying being around my kids and my grandkids. Then they've improved. I, I think that the whole aspect of tinnitus is you can have tinnitus and not be bothered by it and not feel that this is changing my life. I, I once had a patient who said, um, I have tinnitus, but it no longer has me. And I thought that was an interesting comment from a patient because they, their tinnitus didn't change. And I, do, I did emphasize to my patients that it's not about the perceived sound that, that you're perceiving. It's about, is it changing your life in a negative manner? If it's changing your life in a negative manner, you should do something about it. And if you could get to the point where it's no longer changing your life in a negative manner, you've made the adjustment that needs to be made. And so I would consider that an improvement and a success. I love that. And hearing you talk about that, it makes me think of all the people that I've been involved with who, when they are better, you can tell. You can yeah. tell. They're feeling yeah. better. They're doing things they used to do, feeling like their old self again. So that is very possible. I'm in line with your message of hope there. I want to ask you a question that I can't ask every guest, which is to help us understand the different products for tinnitus that have been researched, created, manufactured over the last number of decades that are designed specifically for tinnitus treatment. And when you were working clinically for many years in San Francisco, California, how did that impact your patients? And what of those, what were these different generations of products always improving or iterating? Yeah, again, a very interesting question. And there have been so many products that have come out. I, I began my work in tinnitus in, I think, around nine. I, I received my PhD from Northwestern. And, and in fact, my professor, my mentor from Northwestern was the father of audiology, the most famous audiologist of all time, a fellow by the name of Raymond Carhart. And I remember saying to him that I was interested in tinnitus and I wanted to do my dissertation on it. And he told me, he said, if you do your dissertation on tinnitus, you're going to be here for the next 10 years. He said, and I don't think you want to be here in, in cold, snowy Chicago at Northwestern for the next 10 years. And he said that because there are so many variables involved that the tinnitus patient has to deal with and that the researcher would have to deal with in order to do a proper, valid, reliable scientific study. So at the time that I began in this, there were no products per se. The, you know, people have talked about, well, you know, back in the ancient Greek days about the word tinnitus had come out and there were things, that, of course, everybody thought anybody who had tinnitus was crazy, which of course we now know is not the case. But at the time I began in this, probably the most well-known researcher in tinnitus was a fellow by the name of Jack Vernon, who was working up in Oregon. And in fact, Jack Vernon made tremendous contributions to the field, mostly in terms of getting professionals to be involved with treatment. Prior to what he was doing, there were very few professionals who would work with a tinnitus patient. Many ear, nose, and throat doctors would throw up their hands and say, I don't know what to do for you. You just have to learn to live with it, which is a terrible thing. And I'm sure this in every one of your podcasts that comes up, it's a terrible thing to say to a patient that you just have to learn to live with it. Our job as professionals is to help them to learn to live with it. So Jack Vernon went back and looked at some of the early work on, on tinnitus that was done by researchers and recognized, as did people back in ancient times, that other sounds that were really coming from the outside could interfere with a person's perception of their tinnitus. And so he developed and really worked on the whole concept of masking or covering up a person's tinnitus perception by using another sound. And he had developed very specific procedures for matching the tinnitus and then providing a sound that would 
interfere with the person's perception of tinnitus. So the first instruments that really came out to help a tinnitus patient were these devices that just produced a narrow band of noise that was centered around the pitch of somebody's perceived tinnitus. And they were called maskers. And at first, when that came out, there was research that was done primarily coming out of his labs, but research that was saying, this will work on 80% of the patients. Well, myself and other researchers at the time who got involved in this recognized that it didn't work on 80% of the patients. It did work on many patients. Many patients found this to be of use, but then they would also, you would have a significant number of people who would come back and say, well, all we're doing is substituting one sound for another. And so I'm still being bothered by the fact that I'm hearing this one sound. So the maskers didn't work for everybody. People then realized, well, you know, hearing aids also could serve a purpose because not only would they help to mask the tinnitus, but they would also have a tendency to reduce the brain's need for receiving sound that they weren't receiving because of their hearing loss. And so hearing aids became a popular approach and, and remain to this day perhaps the most popular of the instruments to use for a patient. And, 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 because, and it's largely because it's attacking more than one problem. It's attacking the hearing problem. And, you know, anybody with a hearing problem recognizes the effect that it can have on your daily living. And so by using hearing aids, a lot of people realize, well, I'm not hearing the tinnitus as much. That's an improvement. And I am hearing a lot better and I'm able to socially engage a lot better. So those improvements, so it made hearing aids a very viable instrument and to this day. And then after that came various devices that would, and there were a wide variety of them that would use music, that would use different tones that would use a broad band of frequent of frequencies that would even bedside uh, a, approaches that would use um, birds tweeting and and waves crashing and things like that so a number of approaches came out there was an approach that we tried that was using beats where the sound would kind of go back and forth in your head and people felt that that might be of some use. You know, one of the biggest things that happened was when patients started, well, not patients, when professionals started to realize the tinnitus was coming from the brain, regardless of where it was originating, which was probably more often than not in the ear or in the jaw or in the neck, once professionals realized that ultimately this was coming from the brain. And I'm sure, you, you know, it's been mentioned in your podcasts that, you know, the very simple concept of cutting the nerve that runs between the ear and the brain would leave a person as deaf as my desk, but would still leave them with the perception of tinnitus made everyone recognize that this is coming from the brain and all of the MRI studies and different advanced studies that are done today have, of course, verified and have even pinpointed where in the brain the tinnitus is coming from. So, so many of the instruments now are geared towards attacking the brain or are geared towards trying to distract the patient or to mix the signal with the patient. I don't think that there's an, in fact, I know one of the few things I do know for sure about tinnitus is that there is no one instrument that's going to do it. And I think that the idea is to try a lot of different kinds of instruments that may be of, of benefit to the patient and let the patient realize that we're going to try a lot of different things here. Maybe we'll hit it right on our very first thing. And if we do, that's great. But if we don't, don't be bummed out. We're going to try something else and we're going to keep trying until we could find something that is of benefit for you. But I think that also it's so essential that the patient understand that the instrument is a that using any kind of sound therapy or any any music therapy or anything, it's a vehicle to get the brain to the point where it gets the the message that I'm not going to let the tinnitus alter the quality of my life 
that's the goal. It's not the goal of knocking out the tinnitus. It's the goal of, I'm not going to let this affect the quality of my life. And from what I'm seeing, the protocols, the approaches, the best practice, it's still based in habituation of the brain plasticity, able to reduce the perception and go from bothersome tinnitus to non-bothersome tinnitus. Yeah. And from my experience, usually along that journey, the sound gets softer too. Does not need to go to zero, mm -hmm. but it usually gets softer too. Would you, yeah, it, would you agree it, with that overall statement that during the habituation process, the sound usually gets somewhat softer too? Or well, not so, always? Yeah, I mean, I think that the perception of the tinnitus gets softer. I, I never like to call tinnitus a sound because it isn't really a sound. But um, I think that the perception gets softer. But I'm, I, I've never been convinced that mm -hmm. the actual production of the tinnitus has changed. I think it's a matter of the person's attention has changed to it. Yeah. And the person has placed it as as you know people talk about with tinnitus retraining therapy that they've assigned a different meaning to it mm -hmm. and the meaning that they've assigned to it is no longer one that is at the forefront of their consciousness that this is the most important thing going on it's not the most it shouldn't be the most important thing going on so i think as a person gains that perspective it allows their brain to not focus on the tinnitus and that in itself would reduce the apparent intensity or magnitude of the tinnitus. Yeah, it's a good point because when I'm helping patients, when our team at Treble Health is helping patients, we're asking them at the beginning some important metrics. How often do you think of it? What percentage of the day do you think about it? That's the awareness mm -hmm. level. What percentage of the day are you bothered or annoyed by it? And then how would you rate the volume subjectively from, from one very, very soft to 10, very, very loud? People typically do when they're habituated report that their volume from one to 10 is, is better. And yeah. so, so that would, that seems to be, it's softer, right? Well, what we're introducing here is a more sophisticated look into, well, the brain activity of that tinnitus may be about the same, but the way that the the deep brain is interpreting the sound can change. And that leads to this shift from one to 10. So yeah. subtle, important points to bring up. Yeah. And I think that you're, that the most important point that you just bring up is the fact that this is subjective, the same loudness, you know, loudness is a psychological construct. I remember being involved in, in some work long, long time ago that we looked at the how a person perceived the loudness. We took two groups of people. We took a group of people who loved classical music and we took a group of people who loved hard rock music and we and we played them these two music passages at exactly the same intensity level, the same physical intensity level and very high. And we asked the subjects in this experiment which one was louder? Which one was too loud? And the people who loved classical music consistently said the rock music was too loud. And the people who loved the hard rock music consistently said the classical music was too loud. So loudness is a psychological construct, not a physical construct. And as a result, I agree with you completely that as a person habituates to the tinnitus, they would then assume that the loudness of the tinnitus has dropped. Mm. Yeah, so important. So important. Why? Because individuals who are listening that have tinnitus are coming to this information, searching online, going to their doctor to reduce this intensity of the signal. So it's important to define success and talk about these details so that someone who's listening, you can manage your expectations, have a timeline. I had a patient once tell me, they said, you know, Dr. Ben, what you've done for me is great. You've given me a roadmap to this very challenging condition. Now I'm still struggling day by day. Some days I have better days than others. I'm getting better, but simply to know what to expect and to have a guide and a roadmap is key. Yeah. Do a lot of yeah. your patients in years past sort of share a similar sentiment? Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And I think that that is what the professional is doing. The professional is a guide. I always emphasize to my patients that number one, this is going to take time and maybe we'll get to the place where you're satisfied quickly, but it may not get there quickly, but I'm not going to give up on you. 
But I also want you, the patient, to understand that when you succeed, it's on you. You've the, you're the one who has succeeded. All I've done is I've guided you in the direction that, you know, I've learned from reading papers and seeing other patients and hearing other uh, experts in the field. But Ultimately, the success or failure of any approach that we do is going to be up to you. So when you succeed, you pat yourself on the back rather than me. But and this is the always tricky and how you would say this. But if you don't succeed, I don't I it, it's not really fair for you to say, oh, you screwed up. For, you didn't help me, Dr. Sweeto. My job is to guide you, is to give you, like you said, the roadmap to get there. and you know, and recognize there's going to be peaks and valleys. And it's really important to not get too high during the peaks and not get too low during the valleys to recognize that the progress that we're going to make is not going to be linear. It's not going to be straight across that we could measure. There are going to be things that happen in your life that adversely affect the tinnitus. And that's not because of the tinnitus. Stressors in your life will adversely affect it. If you don't feel good, it's going to adversely affect it. If you're not sleeping well, it's going to adversely affect it. If you're having trouble at work or trouble in your marriage, it's going to adversely affect it. And that's not on the tinnitus. That's part of life. And then there are going to be days when you will say, wow, I, I don't hear my tinnitus at all today. And you will get really elated about that. But I would warn the patient, don't get too elated about it because this progress is going to go up and down, but we just want it to go gradually up ultimately and to, to the point where you've habituated. Yeah, that's excellent. I wanted to ask something that maybe only you and a few others can answer. You've managed a large university hospital clinic of audiologists and you've had close relationship with ENT doctors, what are some tips you would have to the patient to navigate this space of, should I go to an audiologist? Should I go to an ENT doctor? Should I go to a psychologist? Who's going to help me? I go to one doctor in my local town. They give me a test. They tell me, this is what I know and go figure it out. What's your message for how to get the best care possible? Well, I think that first of all, you know, I think that university clinics, clinics that have more than one person tend to be better for a tinnitus patient, because I think that there's the opportunity for the professionals to collaborate with each other, to share each other's experiences. I think you have to start with the ENT. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any way around it, even though many ENTs have a pretty superficial knowledge of tinnitus, to be honest. You have to start with them because there's a good chance that the tinnitus is being caused by something that might be cured. And if you've got that possibility, that's where you want to be going. So I think you start with the ENT. I think the ENT who says there's nothing you could do about it, learn to live with it, is not a good tinnitus person for you. I think at that point, you need to find is are there audiologists in the area who can deal with this? I think more audiologists have gotten involved in the long term care of a tinnitus patient than the physician, because the physician, if, if they can't give you medication or surgery, they're not going to spend the time working with you. They don't have, and it's not their fault, they don't have that time. Audiologists who work with tinnitus patients have carved out that time in their practice to be able to work with the patient. And I think that a psychologist is an important addition to it. You know, my approach on tinnitus, again, one of the first papers I ever wrote on tinnitus had to do with the cognitive aspects, the, the thinking aspects of tinnitus. And the reason that I thought about it was because I was reading about how cognitive therapy works with patients who have chronic pain. And in a sense, chronic pain is like tinnitus. It's invisible. It's there most of the time. And 
different people have different thresholds of what they could handle and of how something would impact them. So I think that, you know, it, it, there are organizations like uh, the American Tinnitus Association, the British Tinnitus Association that are good places to start because if you go online and look at, uh, they, they might be able to say, well, here are the audiologists or here are the physicians that we know of that have worked with tinnitus patients. Seeing a professional who's never seen a tinnitus patient and expecting them to be able to really help the tinnitus patient is tricky because they're not going to know the different pathways and the different roadmaps that might benefit the patient. And I think it's essential in talking to a tinnitus practitioner, a tinnitus professional to say what kinds of approaches do you use? And it's my personal opinion that if their approach is one single approach, that's not the person I would want to deal with if I was the patient. I want to deal with somebody who has uh, multiple tools to try to help me. Totally agree. Totally agree. And as a professional, we are training with specialists who say, this is the way. And then we're also training with other specialists that say, no, this is the way. And th those of us, I would say myself and our team are taking bits and pieces. I look at it like a uh, three-legged stool with cognitive tools, sound therapy, and mindfulness all playing mm -hmm. a very important and complementary role. You don't have to choose one or the other yeah. people. We, we want all of them yeah. uh, to, in, in your own unique way, because not everyone will try mindfulness in the same way. And not everyone wants to use sound therapy in the same way. So yeah, exactly. it's been an excellent discussion, Dr. Sweeto. Personally, I want to say thank you. For those of you who may not know, my mentor at UCSF was Dr. Troy Kasha. Dr. Troy Kasha was trained under Dr. Robert Sweeto. So this is a multi-generation approach to what is the best possible treatment for tinnitus? How can we give the best service? How can we reduce tinnitus as much as possible? That's why we're all here. So Dr. Suido, thank you so much for the, the work that you've done and the research you've done. It has certainly uh, paved the way for professionals like myself to continue helping tinnitus patients. Yeah, well, thank you. That's kind of you to say. And so I'm kind of like your grandfather, your, your grand mentor then, I guess. <laughs> if, uh, would, would you please accept my, my offer to be my grand mentor? I, you have no I, choice. I, you have no choice in the matter. I, I will. And I will look forward to getting nice presents on my birthday and things like that from my grandson. <laughs> All right. That, that sounds lovely. Thanks again, Dr. Sweeto. Okay, and pleasure. for everyone watching, please remember to check out our other episodes on the Treble Health podcast. And if you are interested, we have a telehealth service available to have conversations and consultation with an expert tinnitus audiologist. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.